My first summer in the Sierra by John Muir. July first. Summer is ripe. Flocks of seeds are already out of their cups and pods, seeking their predestined places. Some will strike root and grow up beside their parents. Others flying on the wings of the wind, far from them, among strangers. Most of the young birds are full feathered. And out of their nests, though still looked after by both father and mother, protected and fed, and to some extent educated, how beautiful the home life of birds! No wonder we all love them. I like to watch the squirrels. There are two species here: the large California gray and the Douglas. The latter is the brightest of all the squirrels I've ever seen. A hot spark of life, making every tree tingle with its prickly toes, a condensed nugget of fresh mountain vigor and valor, as free from disease as a sunbeam. One cannot think of such an animal ever being weary or sick. He seems to think the mountains belong to him, and at first try to drive away the whole flock of sheep. As well as the shepherd and dogs, how he scolds and what faces he makes, all eyes, teeth, and whiskers. If not so comically small, he would indeed be a dreadful fellow. I should like to know more about his bringing up, his life in the home knot hole, as well as in the tree tops, throughout all seasons. Strange. That I have not yet found a nest full of young ones. The Douglas is nearly allied to the red squirrel of the Atlantic slope, and may have been distributed to this side of the continent by way of the great unbroken forests of the north. The California gray is one of the most beautiful, and next to the Douglas, the most interesting of our hairy neighbors. Compared with the Douglas, he's twice as large, but far less lively and influential as a worker in the woods, and he manages to make his way through leaves and branches with less stir than his small brother. I have never heard him bar bark at anything except our dogs. When in search of food, he glides silently from branch to branch. Examining last year's cones to see whether some few seeds may not be left between the scales, or gleans of fallen ones among the leaves on the ground, since none of the present season's crop is yet available, his tail floats now behind him, now above him, level or gracefully curled, like a wisp of cirrus cloud. Every hair. In its place, clean and shining and radiant, a thistle down in spite of rough gummy work. His whole body seems about as unsubstantial as his tail. The little Douglas is fiery, peppery, full of brag and fight and show, with movements so quick and keen they almost sting the onlooker. And the Halloween gyrating show he makes of himself turns one giddy to see. The gray is shy and sometimes stealthy in his movements, as if half expecting an enemy in every tree and bush, and back of every log, wishing only to be let alone apparently, and manifesting no desire to be seen, or admired, or feared. In spite of enemies, squirrels are happy fellows, forest favorites, types of tireless life. Of all nature's wild beasts, they seem to me the wildest. May we come to know each other better. The chaparral-covered hill slope to the south of the camp, besides furnishing nesting places for countless merry birds, is the home. And hiding place 
of the curious wood rat, a handsome, interesting animal, always attracting attention wherever seen. It is more like a squirrel than a rat, is much larger, has delicate, thick, soft fur of a bluish slate color, white on the belly, ears large, thin, and translucent, eyes soft, full, and liquid, claws slender, sharp as needles, and as his limb are strong, he can climb about as well as a squirrel. No rat or squirrel has so innocent a look, is so easily approached, or expresses such confidence in one's good intentions. He seems too fine for the thorny thickets he inhabits, and his hut also is as unlike himself as may be, though softly furnished inside. No other animal inhabitant of these mountains builds houses so large and striking in appearance. The traveler coming suddenly upon a group of them for the first time would not be likely to forget them. They are built of all kinds of sticks, old rotten pieces picked up anywhere, and green prickly twigs bitten from the nearest bushes the whole mixed with miscellaneous odds and ends of everything movable, such as bits of cloudy earth, stones, bones, deer horn, etc., piled up in a conical mass, as if it were got ready for burning. Some of these curious cabins are six feet high and as wide as the base, and a dozen or more of them are occasionally grouped together, less perhaps for the sake of society than for advantage of food and shelter.